<laughs> okay, well, hello everyone. It's good to be back at Skepticon. I've missed every single one of you, even the ones who were never here before. So this, this is very pleasant to be here. Uh, so in case you don't know who I am or you forgot who I am, uh, the name is P.Z. Myers. Yeah, you can just call me P.Z. I am a professor at the University of Minnesota Morris, a small liberal arts institution that's built on the lands of the Dakota, the Lakota, and the Anishinaabe people. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm very much interested in things like public education. My specialties are genetics and cell biology and developmental biology. So that's often what I come here and bore people with. So, so if you're very tired from partying last night, this is your opportunity to catch up on your sleep a little bit. <laughs> okay, so when I, was, when, I was, when I was contacted by Lauren about this and she asked for a title, I came up with this one, The Wonderful Fuzziness of Genes, How They Do and Don't Define You and Your Family. Notice I squeezed in the theme of the conference, so we're talking about family. Um, and I did this like a month before I actually sat down and wrote the talk. And a month means I had time to get angry. So uh, this is such a nice title, so friendly. And yet what really concerns me is, uh, is this kind of thing. So here we are, we're living in the United States of America, which turns out to be a Nazi hotbed. Uh, we've got all kinds of racism going on all over the place, just racists coming out of the woodwork everywhere. You know, this is what ought to get you upset, not an occasional picture of spiders, right? Because this is worse than spiders. This is horrible stuff. And it's, it's something I worry about a lot. One reason I worry about it a lot is a lot of these people use really bad genetics to justify what they're doing. I mean, terrible genetics. And part of it is a problem with how we teach genetics. Yeah, what I do for a living. So uh, I take, take it kind of personally that they're doing this sort of thing. Uh, <coughs> so one question I have, though, is how did we get here from here, right? Because this, this is, of course, Gregor Mendel. Uh, it, it, he seems to have been generally a nice guy despite being a Roman Catholic priest, okay? We'll excuse that. But he was, uh, he was, he was properly ambitious. He had degrees in engineering and mathematics. He used it to teach physics and math to students at the Catholic school at the monastery where he worked. And for a sideline, he did a few experiments, a few simple experiments. In the 1860s, he sat down and he did a number of crosses with pea plants, which you've all heard about, right? Has everybody heard about, yeah, the Mendel's pea plants and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's good work. It was revolutionary work at the time, but it was not appreciated during his lifetime. So he published one paper, that's it up there, that's Research in Plant Hybrids, and he pl published it in a small journal, small European journal, and it didn't go anywhere. Nobody paid attention to it, hardly anybody cited. Uh, it was kind of lost to the world uh, as many scientific papers are that get published in small, obscure journals. He wasn't, he wasn't the kind of guy Charles Darwin was. Darwin was constantly corresponding with scientists all around the world and talking about his work and going, and if he didn't go to meetings, he had proxies who go to meetings and talk about these things for him. Uh, not Mendel. He was busy. He was going to become the abbot of his monastery. He's doing all this teaching work there. Uh, I imagine he's doing various Catholic sorts of things, whatever those are, I don't know. Uh, but he did try. He corresponded to the, with this guy called Carl Nageli. Uh, Nageli was probably the top man in Europe at that time, 
studying the ideas of inheritance. He didn't come up with anything quite as revolutionary as Mendel did. Mendel sent him his paper and uh, Nagley responded by saying, oh, this isn't so good. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of boring. Uh, why are you working on, plant, on pea plants? Why don't you switch to something more interesting like hawkweed? Hawkweed, it turns out, has remarkably complicated genetics. So that, that was bad advice. And so it just kind of died. Nobody paid any attention to the paper. Uh, and then the paper just sort of faded away until 1900. Just sitting in obscure libraries and obscure journals. Nobody reading it. Uh, I want to tell you, if you do read it, it will put you to sleep because it's all statistics. It's all tables and tables of numbers. And here's all these hundreds of experiments, these crosses I did. Here's all these results. Uh, it's, it's like counting sheep, only you're counting pea plants. <laughs> okay, so it's just kind of lingering there. Now, before I go on, though, I want to make emphasize something really important, and that is I've read what little we can find about uh, Mendel's published work. I've read his paper. I've read some of his correspondence. There's nothing racist in any of it. I don't know. Maybe he was, you know, closet racist, but no, it didn't come out in public. He seems to have been a fairly well, well-rounded sort of guy who didn't go in for any of this. So let me say, even though I'm going to be talking about how Mendel's work is going to get abused, Mendel himself is not a bad guy. Doesn't seem to be a racist bone visible in his body. And Mendelian genetics did not conjure racism out of nothing. Racism was there before Mendel, long before. And uh, he predicted that he, his time will come, but it's not going to come yet. We're going to have to talk a little bit about racism as an enlightenment value. Yeah, you know, we've been through this, all of us atheists. And there was a long period when everyone was saying, oh, yeah, the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment was wonderful. This is what we are to sponsor as more of the Enlightenment. But when you get right down to it, uh, there was a lot of crap, poisonous crap in the Enlightenment. So uh, this is just a short, partial list, a tiny subset of the people long before Mendel who were proposing these ideas. So like Robert Boyle, Boyle's Law? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so famous chemist, famous scientist in a lot of fields. Uh, Robert Boyle, back then in the 17th century, uh, he suggested that all races descended from Adam and Eve. That's nice. Common origin for all the races of man on planet Earth. That's yeah, he'd fit right in with answers in Genesis on that. Uh, but part of his argument was that Adam and Eve were white. They were definitely white. Uh, that Europeans were better because, as I quote here, they possessed stature, calmly symmetry of the parts of the body, and good features in the face, unlike all those other races, of course. So this was a pretty common sort of sentiment. We're talking about the Enlightenment. It's the rise of the colonial period. Europeans are finally waking up. They're getting woke and looking out and seeing all these other places. And uh, they are unable to resist the temptation to call themselves so much better than those. Then, of course, there's Carl Linnaeus, father of taxonomy. And one of the things he did is he, he characterized humanity as belonging to five separate races. Oh, one of the peculiar thing about this period, if you'd talk to the ver about the various racists who were promoting these ideas, none of them had the same number of races. So Linnaeus said there were five, uh, Americanus, Europeanus, Asiaticus, and Africanus. And also he threw in the fifth one, uh, Monstrosus, which is kind of a grab bag of giants and pygmies and people with one eye in the middle of their forehead and a lot of things that he'd never seen. So we're, all, we're already subdividing the race, even, though, even from a guy who knew nothing about these other races. Uh, I have to mention Thomas Jefferson. 
Yes, while he was not writing the Declaration of, of Independence or not raping his black slaves, he had distinct ideas about the different races. So he said the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowment of both body and mind. Yeah, that's, that's one of our founding fathers. And this was a pretty common sentiment then. Uh, Cuvier, yeah, another famous scientist from the uh, 18th century. He says, the features of the Negro race are approximate, approximated to the monkey, the tribe, the hordes of which it cons consists have always remained in the most complete state of barbarism. And then I also got to mention Arthur de Gobineau. Uh, he's particularly infamous now. He was a favorite of a certain man who ran the country of Germany for a short while. Uh, he claimed that there were three races, white, brown, and yellow. And he invented the term Aryan, which we've heard before in unpleasant context. And he says a white race originally possessed the monopoly of beauty, intelligence, and strength. Yeah, this is ugly stuff. All of this is before Mendel. So I'm just telling you this so that you don't tar Mendel with this kind of poisonous, nasty stuff. He was not responsible for this. He did not promote this. OK. But Mendel still, 1865, he does these experiments. He publishes. Uh, they disappear. But then they get rediscovered in 1900. Uh, it, it's often considered kind of miraculous that a number of people, at least these are three of the most prominent who rediscovered it, went back and cited Mendel's paper, quoted it in meetings and so forth. Uh, it's, it's actually because at the time of Mendel, remember I mentioned Carl Nageli and he's talking to him, lots of people were working on the problem of inheritance and genetics. That in particular, for instance, at this time, we had all these amazing results from microscopy, histology, uh, cell biology. We knew about chromosomes. People are watching it. chromosomes wiggle around in the nucleus and they think, hey, you know, those things, they probably had something to do with inheritance. We don't quite have a sharp idea yet, but it seems like there is something getting sorted out in the cell at cell division. And so when they found Mendel, they said, hey, this is perfect, because Mendel dis described things like, hey, there's two pair, there's pairs of factors, and they sort out somehow prior to fertilization, and they recombine, and you get new combinations by random chance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all sounds to fit their experimental models. So they rediscovered this stuff. So in 1900 is the big year. It's like Boom, everyone is talking about Mendel all of a sudden and about these dramatic results. Now, before I go on, I've got to tell you, you, you know how science works? People argue all the time. You don't, you don't think that they rediscovered Mendel and everyone said, oh, okay, well, that problem's done. We figured it all out, we've solved. No, they fought back and forth over this. There were a lot of people who detested Mendel's work. I got to mention a few of these. Oh, I also mentioned this was all too late. This was all rediscovered 16 years after Mendel had died. So uh, he kind of predicted they'd come around, but too late to uh, do any good for his reputation at that time. OK, so the people who are fighting against this, there's a category of scientists. They called themselves the biometricians. And uh, what biometrics is, is just the careful measurement of the parameters of the organism. Uh, they also were doing all kinds of statistics. These people were famous for s developing statistical techniques. So among these people is, uh, there's uh, Walt Welton, well, he called himself Raphael. Raphael Walt Weldon was probably the leader of this bunch. Uh, he is unfortunately going to die in the middle of the conflict at a young age, so he's going to drop out. But he's inspiring a lot of people to do this stuff. Uh, he's also a follower of 
Francis Galton. And I will save my venom for a while, but Galton is one of those people I really could not stand, a horrible, horrible person. But he made serious contributions to statistics and the study of biology. Got to give him credit for that. Uh, Carl Pearson, any statisticians here? You've heard of Pearson? Yes, Pearson's correlation coefficient, for instance, there's a lot of things. Uh, Pearson was a mathematician who contributed to a lot of statistical thought and a lot of statistical uh, tools, so very important guy there. And then uh, Ronald Fisher. R.A. Fisher was a, an important contributor to uh, <coughs> population genetics. He's, he's indispensable to that, that particular discipline, so really important guy. Uh, curious thing about these people, uh, Francis Galton is the guy who invented eugenics. Uh, Carl Pearson had a number of things to say. Uh, so he said, for instance, that uh, white people were superior to others. He was kind of a, an important leader of white nationalism at the time. And uh, Ronald Fisher, well, Ronald Fisher would go on to be a Nazi sympathizer in World War II. So, yeah, you can, you can see the kind of people we're talking about here. Uh, Weldon, not so bad, but he did favor eugenics. So, yeah, this is a little collection of deplorables. Uh, interestingly, the ones, those ones on the right, they've been in the news in the last few years because various colleges in England who had named departments after them or put up monuments to them were really, uh, this guy's not exactly the one we want to honor. So there's been a whole bunch of cancel culture going on where people have been removing their names from various buildings. So yeah, that's, that's kind of a deplorable thing there. But I want to emphasize that they had some really bad ideas, but they also had some really good ideas. And those good ideas have lived on. Unfortunately, the bad ideas also seem to be thriving. But yeah, yeah don't just throw everyone out because they, they had a few terrible, terrible ideas. Throw out their terrible ideas and think about the good stuff. Okay, so the biometricians are sitting there and they're saying, no, it can't be Mendel. Mendel's wrong. They're disagreeing with Mendel all over the place. Uh, this is going to last about a decade before they wise up. Uh, there was, so there was also some defenders. So here's uh, William Bateson. William Bateson, I, I really like William Bateson. Okay, for among other things, he did a lot of work on early phenotypes. He looked at things like homeotic mutations, so how you know, one part of a fly gets transformed into a different part. And so he's laying the groundwork for a lot of later Evo Devo work. But he's also promoting Mendel's ideas. So he's, he's gung-ho for Mendel. I throw in a couple of other, there are a lot of people who are defending Mendel at this time. I just mentioned a few. Uh, one is Edith Saunders, because I'm sorry if you go back to the beginning of the 20th century and yes, who's doing all the cool biology? Uh, nobody ever mentions the women. So there, in genetics, there were a huge number of women who were making very significant contributions to the field. Uh, Edith Saunders, Saunders was just one of them. Uh, she was a botanist, but also very strongly pro-Mendelian. She was seeing this in her own work, the kinds of Mendelian results that Mendel reported. And then I also had to throw in Thomas Hunt Morgan, because otherwise this is almost exclusively a British party. It's all a big club of British biologists and geneticists doing all this stuff. Uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan, of course, is an American. He's best known for his work with fruit flies. But he's going to establish the reality of Mendelian inheritance in his work. So we got all these Mendelians cruising away. So you might ask, what's the deal? What's the difference between these guys besides rejecting Mendel? Well, there's a couple of points made here. Uh, one is that the biometricians argued that Mendel couldn't be right because there's this thing called continuous variation. That for example, if I had everybody in this room stand up and line up, we'd see that there's a range of different heights. 
It doesn't look Mendelian. It's not like there are short people and there are tall people and there's nobody in between. And the biometricians were rightly pointing out that, hey, you can't describe biology if you just say everything is a discrete binary. Right? And, and the patterns don't seem to follow when you look at the inheritance of various things. The Mendelians, on the other hand, hand were big about discrete variation, abrupt changes. Bateson, remember, was doing all this work on homeotic mutations, where in a single generation you change a fly's antenna into a leg. So the thing, hey, yeah, this, this fits with Mendel. And he could do crosses with various species and get that same kind of Mendelian result. Get the same results that Mendel saw, not just with pea plants. So another big difference, obviously, is the bio biometricians rejected Mendel. Their argument was, Mendel is just too simple. This is, this is not how the reality works. So we have to throw him out. Uh, the Mendelians, of course, embraced Mendel, and as I'll show you in a moment, they kind of embraced him a little too hard. They were too gung-ho about Mendel. Uh, one of the key things they argued about was evolution. So the biometricians claimed the mantle of Darwin because he said, all this, this subtle variations, that fits with Darwinian evolution. Evolution is incremental and gradual. It's not sudden and abrupt. Of course, the Mendelians were then arguing for something called saltation. That is, that evolution proceeded by jumps. They were sometimes called the saltationists. So that's not so great. And finally, the key thing is how do you approach the science? The biometricians were basically pulling out rulers and tape measures and, and counting things and, say, and doing statistics. So they're, they're doing a descriptive kind of biology where they're looking at the world around them and summarizing the variation that they see. Mendelians, on the other hand, were all about mechanisms. So how do we get these different processes out of, these, out of cells? Now, what's the mechanism behind it all? And they were talking about nuclei and chromosomes and these concrete things that we could do experiments with. Uh, but let me just say, the biometricians weren't, oh, whoop, I thought I had one here. No, not. Uh, so the biometricians and the Mendelians were fighting with each other. And uh, I would ask you now, but I just flashed the answer to you. Who was, who do you favor? Who do you think was right? Anyone got any opinions on them? Are you awake enough? You're in favor of the Mendelians? Yeah, I asked my wife that last night. She said the Mendelians too. So yeah, there's, there's this kind of idea that the, Mendel, the Mendelians are going to win. And they sort of did, but they're still, it's still not right to think in terms of two camps. This isn't how science works. So what we do in science is we like to pick and choose. Yeah, we're, we're cafeteria geneticists. And we go through these different camps. We say, oh, this one was right, and this one was right. And what we have to do is combine these and come up with a better answer than just all Mendel or all, all non-Mendelian. So there's going to be a little struggle about this. So let's talk a little bit about these differences and how they were resolved. So we got these two camps. And you're saying, why do I have a picture of a horse there? And I'll explain. Uh, so as I said, one of the things the biometricians were into was continuous variation. And for instance, Carl Pearson wrote a really interesting paper that I reread just a little while ago. And I think it's from like 1908 or something like that, uh, where he took it as an example, pedigreed horses. If you think about it, that's a great tool for doing genetics because you got this long history all carefully recorded. There's phenotypes carefully written down. You got the lineage right there. You know who made it with who. It's a big deal. And uh, Carl Pearson went through this and he said, you know, the rules of coat color don't seem to apply very well. That we're not seeing anything like dominant and recessive coat colors appearing. We're seeing gradations. And sometimes we're getting surprises because we do the cross and hey, you expect these two brown horses to give you a brown horse? And no, they don't. They give you a red-coated horse. 
So it was much more complicated. And that's good stuff. It's underappreciated now, but I think that's an important thing. Uh, the Mendelians, on the other hand, of course, are all going on and on about discrete variations and uh, Mendelian sorts of ideas. And as I'll show you in a little bit, they kind of went overboard. Okay, and I'd actually give both camps a thumbs up on this one. That both are describing important phenomena. Then of course there's this business of rejecting Mendel. I'm sorry, biometricians, you lose on that one. You shouldn't just throw out Mendel. Mendel's got a lot of good, interesting concepts that are worth understanding. Uh, Mendelians maybe went a little too far. Uh, but also I gotta say, it's never black and white. This is another lesson here, is that when you look carefully at the work of these scientists, they had rather nuanced views. So for instance, uh, this is gonna be almost impossible for you to read, but uh, Weldon, for instance, wrote, I think that there must be an element in each gamete corresponding to every quality transmitted by it. Some of these may blend with corresponding elements in the, of the other. Some may exclude corresponding elements of the other. Some may, may make a patchwork resulting in a particulate, what we call, might call variegated inheritance. So Weldon is reading, he, he wrote this in response to reading uh, Mendel's paper the first time. And he's recognizing the important stuff there that we need to understand that mechanism. And Mendel seems to be the tool to do that. Uh, this next one, the differences in evolution. Oh man, uh, I waffled on this one. I need something that's a cross between an X and a check mark, because both of them got things wrong and both of them got things right, okay. So yeah, it's, it's, there is definitely incremental evolution going on but we can also see discrete patterns of inheritance. It's when you look at populations that you really see the patterns emerge in complex, nuanced sorts of ways. Uh, when you look at individual cases like model systems like I work with, uh, it looks a lot more discrete. So it's kind of a toss up between both of them. And then of course, hey, statistics matters. It's really important. I tell my students that you're better off taking a year of statistics versus a year of calculus, right? Because in biology, that makes more of a difference. There are exceptions, of course, but generally, statistics is so much more useful for biologists than any of the more advanced mathematical principles are. I know that feels like heresy to say it, but it's true. And of course, the Mendelians, that's going to lead to the whole, whole bunch of cool stuff emerging. You know, all that stuff from the Human Genome Project, uh, 23andMe, all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, that's all going to rely on information that was acquired by looking at Mendelian patterns of inheritance. So they're all important. So you see my point here is that it's, it's not black and white. You can't say one group is wrong and the other is right. There's a little bit of everything from there. But I also pointed out that uh, there was an overreaction, overreaction, a really serious overreaction by the Mendelians and a little bit too much enthusiasm for Mendelian genetics. So let me give you some examples of that because there was this early pattern of trying to fit everything into a Mendelian model. For example, eye color. Who knows how eye color is inherited? Yeah, it, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta know a lot of stuff to figure that, because it's complicated. But that didn't stop the Mendelians in 1907. Uh, Davenport and Davenport, Davenport, by the way, is a horrible person who was one of the early promoters of eugenics in the United States. Uh, not one of my favorite people. But anyway, he came out with a paper and he says, eye color is the product of a single gene and brown is dominant to the other colors. Oh man, that makes it easy. That's how we can predict. I have, this still goes on. For decades after this, genetics textbooks were publishing this, printing this story that eye color was caused by a single, uh, single factor and that there were a couple of alleles, but that's it. 
Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I got email from somebody who was asking about this, and he was saying, but it's true, isn't it, that two brown-eyed people cannot, no, no two blue-eyed people cannot possibly have brown-eyed children, which is not true. They do, why? Because uh, further research, oh man, it's, it's complicated. That what we know now is that eye color is primarily the product of two genes. So there we are already getting out of the simple Mendelian model. So there's OCA2 and HERC2. But there are all these other genes that also contribute in subtle ways to eye color. We got something called ASIP, IR4, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go through all the acronyms. Uh, but yeah, get into the literature and it's bewildering. There's all, they have all of these little subtle nuances that they add to eye color. I mean, seriously, you, all you gotta do is go to the makeup counter at any of the department stores and look at all the colors they have got there that, they, that people apply to their skin. We are very sensitive to these things. They're very complicated. So right away we see an exaggeration of the importance of Mendelian inheritance. Uh, here's another, I talked about this a couple of years ago at Skepticon. So I'll just mention it briefly. Uh, several years ago, there was a flurry of interest, especially in the tabloids, where they were saying, oh, hey, look at your fingers. That in men, men have stubby little short index figures, fingers, and women have long tapered index fingers, and you could have this simple ratio of the length of your index finger to the length of your ring finger, and uh, that would tell you all kinds of, I know, look at all you people looking at your fingers. <laughs> yeah, this, this was kind of thing that people who like to read horoscopes love to see, right? So yeah, we can just look at our fingers and we can determine what our sex is. And then they were saying things like gay men, long index fingers like women. And if you're bisexual, oh, your, your index and ring fingers are probably about the same length. Okay, I just want to tell you, don't believe it, all right? <laughs> uh, it came out of some work. Here's, here's the raw data from this. This is a set of measures. It's the ratio of the length of the index finger to the, to the ring finger, and they published the distribution. This is classic biometrician sort of stuff. Let's look at the, you know, the range of possibilities here. And uh, look, uh, there on the top, is the ratio for females, and then the second one is the ratio for males. Do you notice that they kind of overlap? There's, there's a statistically significant difference that can be detected if you sample large numbers of people, but it doesn't apply to individuals. So again, stop looking at your fingers. <laughs> it's, it's not going to make a difference and you shouldn't let your finger length determine who you marry anyway, right? That's kind of irrelevant. So uh, yeah, so they come up with these, these measures. And yeah, uh, the ratio for men of index finger to ring finger was 0.98, so roughly the same. The ratio of index finger to ring finger for women is 1.0. Yeah, that's the magnitude of the difference we're looking at. So this is what I mean by there's kind of an um, overreach by the Mendelians. And I saw it all over the place. You know, if I open up my textbook, my genetics book, textbook for my class at home, and look at the problems, they still have problems where human eye color is treated as a simple trait, where coat color in mammals is treated as a simple trait. It doesn't work that way. So this is a problem. We got this going on all over the place. Okay. This in itself, though, you might say, well, okay, so there's, again, you know, horoscope, horoscopes. People don't die over horoscopes, not usually. Uh, why should we worry about these, these silly games that some people play that are overrepresentations of what Mendel said that no reasonable science would accept? It's stuff of the popular press. Uh, but just keep in mind, dates from about 1920 to 1940 was the world center for studying eugenics. 
that we had all kinds of stuff going on in this country that we try to forget right now. Uh, for instance, we had uh, sterilization programs in the United States. We had a lot of people, both Mendelians and biometricians, going out there and saying uh, feeble-minded people ought to be sterilized, that we ought to look at the ancestry of these people. And if you've got a series of generations where you got these low lives and this riffraff and these horrible people that aren't accepted in polite company, we ought to just get it over with. We ought to sterilize them. Some countries went a little farther and said we should kill them, but we didn't quite get to that point, fortunately. Uh, but yeah, there, was, there were sterilization laws where people were being quietly taken aside and snip, snip, getting sterilized in hospitals. And uh, that included, oh, look at, look at, look at, where's, there's, there's Missouri in there, what? Missouri couldn't possibly re be that regressive, could they? Yeah, they were. Okay, they were, they were pretty bad about it. Uh, in Minnesota, where I come from, is even, even up there. So, yeah, this was a, a big problem, and it was largely because people took these simplified versions of how inheritance worked, and they tried to apply them to individual people. And uh, it's, it's a, it was terrible then, it's terrible now. It sort of ended in the you know, roughly 1940s, 1950s for some reason. Can't imagine why, but when they saw somebody being, actually applying these rules, uh, it was so horrific that we had a bit of a revulsion from it. Yes? Yes, we still kept these laws in the books for many years afterwards. And it wouldn't surprise me if there aren't country, uh, states right now that still have these on the books. They're disgraceful. Yes? Are they? She would not be surprised at all. These, these ideas have such popular force that they just keep going and going and going. Uh, as I said, I still get email from people who, who try to impose a simple Mendelian properties on human inheritance. And I bet you Jay does too. <laughs> okay, so what do I blame for this? This is the idea I, I really detest. And it's a very common one. It's this idea of genetic determinism. I had to put it in creepy font to try to get across. <laughs> Don't accept genetic determinism. Genetic determinism is bad, yet so many people think this is the way inheritance works. So this is just the idea that physical and behavioral phenotypes are specified almost exclusively by the genotype. If you go back earlier in the century, uh, many scientists were actually endorsing this idea that, hey, you got one trait, it's associated with one gene. That, that's where we get this idea that eye color, for instance, would come from the f properties of one gene. Uh, there, there was lots of arguments along these lines. I talk about Beadle and Tatum in my class who did this really groundbreaking work. Their hypothesis was that each gene specified an enzyme. And again, that's not pernicious in itself. It's not racism. It's just a very incomplete idea of what a gene is. So we got people, these kinds of things, that when you look at somebody, or you look around this room and look at people, and we say, oh, I know what your genes are. No, you don't. <laughs> Nobody does. It's so much more complicated. There's so many interacting genes that you simply can't do that. But still, genetic determinism led to all these things. It led to things like eugenics, uh, IQ heritability. Oh, that one's still going on, isn't it? We had a president who was pushing this idea that, uh, you could, that IQ is a, something that's fairly simply inherited, that if your uncle was a professor at MIT, you must have a really good brain, too. It's not true. That's not how it works. It led to all these ideas of scientific racism that we can look at black people, we can look at white people, we say, hey, there's a difference there, their genes are so different. This is where the problem comes from. And of course, this whole idea that gender is fixed. If you've got, if you've got the inheritance of the female or male char genetic characteristics, 
Well, you're definitely either female or male. You can't be something in between. You definitely can't change. You, can't, you have to ignore the variety of complex factors that go into making up sex as well as race. Okay, so this is, to sum this up, uh, you know, I'm on social media. It's a horrible thing to be on social media, uh, but that, that tweet on the left captures the sense of it. So he says, every single scientist I know, sex can't be called a binary because we know it exists on a broad spectrum controlled by gene expression. Yeah, it's a complicated thing. Uh, but then you talk to the transfers and they say, excuse me, but when I was eight, someone told me about X and Y chromosomes. <laughs> Case closed. That's it. That's all there is. Uh, we also have this attitude on the right. People whose all of their core beliefs are at odds with the scientific consensus on literally everything. This is everything. This is gender. This is race. This is evolution. Everything. They, they are disagreeing with the scientists. And their comment is, how could all those scientists be so, so wrong? Yeah. I'm sure any of you who are scientists here who go on the internet know this feeling. Who are all these idiots? And how did they get the idea that they're so smart? <laughs> I don't know. OK, uh, just to conclude, though, I want to throw in one last thing. Because a, a good friend of mine, Adam Rutherford, who's a brilliant scientist, brilliant writer, uh, he wrote a little piece about Mendel, just published last week in The Guardian. And uh, it, it, it's basically my talk all in one short article, so I'm kind of embarrassed. Anyway, he, he wrote that uh, we should know our own history. We teach a version of genetics that is easily simplified to the po point of being wrong. The laws in biology have a somewhat tricksy tendency to be beset by qualifications, complexities, and caveats. Biology is inherently messy, and evolution preserves what works, not what is simple. In the simplicity of Mendel's peas is a science which is easily co-opted and marshaled into a racist, fascist ideology, as it was in the US, in Nazi Germany, and in dozens of other countries. To know our history is to inoculate ourselves against it being repeated. And I would just say that in one sentence up there, hey, I could have just gotten up here and said this. We teach a version of genetics that's easily simplified to the point of being wrong. This is true. It's the problem. So I hope all of you are now aware. If somebody tries to give you a simple pat answer to how genetics works, you can tell them, how could you be so, so wrong? And just shut them down, because that's, that's our problem. All right. I think that's enough. I'll stop there. Uh, Lauren told me I'm not supposed to ask, open the door to Q&A. How much time do I have left? Maybe none. Oh, hey, look at that. I got a few minutes. So if there are questions, I will, I will flout Lauren, and I will answer. Yes? Um, you've probably heard about uh, the, uh, the explanation behind the Darwinian theory of evolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no. Where does he get the, it's because Sam Harris is an avid reader of the racist literature. Yes. Oh, yes. But, so the question is, where did Sam Harris, you know, smart guy and all that kind of stuff, get this idea that there's an IQ gap? That where does that come from? And, and my answer is that he's, a, when I listen to Sam Harris, I am listening to a guy who is really steeped in racist literature. He's good buddies with Murray. Yeah, so that's one problem. He seems to have accepted a lot of things that uh, Watson argued for. Uh, yeah, I bet you. I bet you he knows Jensen's papers inside and out. That there's there is this long-lived horrible literature of people who are saying that, for instance, we 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 gave an IQ test to Africans, and the average IQ of an African is 70. 
That's in the literature. There are tables of different countries and the average IQ of the people in those countries. And it's total bullshit. It's a few people who are making these arguments, these self-serving arguments to justify their beliefs in the, in the inherent superiority of white people. Sometimes it's a little more nuanced than that. They'll say, oh yeah, uh, Asian people are really studious, right? So they say they're smart. They're just not as assertive. They're not, uh, James Watson told me this himself. He said, okay, yeah, they're, they might be really book smart, but they don't have the inherent ability to be ambitious and proceed and so forth that us white people, in, in Watson's case, he said specifically the Scots-Irish people, <laughs> because he's Scots-Irish, of course. It, all, it always works that way. Uh, so yeah, there's, that's where it's coming from. That answer the question? Yeah. More or less, yeah. Yeah, really, uh, Sam Harris is not a reliable source of information on, on much of anything, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Anyone else? Maybe time for one more quick one? There are no quick ones here. Yes? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, so what are some good authors to read? about how genetics works. Um, I can give you a couple of, rec one right here, Adam Rutherford. He's got a number of really good books. He's got one called How to Argue with a Racist, which basically goes through all this stuff and says why they're wrong and why we're right. Uh, otherwise, uh, Carl Zimmer, it's, it's huge. It's a great big thick book. Uh, what was the title again? Uh, something about his mother's laugh, yeah. Anyway, look it up. Look up Carl Zimmer. He's got some good stuff out there. Uh, much more nuanced take on all of these ideas. And generally, if you, you, know, if you read the scientific literature, the kinds of stuff that the racists are promoting just doesn't get very far. And maybe part of it's my, my selection criteria for who I'll pay attention to on Twitter, but when I read Twitter, I'm, I'm just floored by all the people who are sitting there happily tar tearing apart racist arguments. You just gotta follow the right people. Yeah, and you know, oh, maybe, I'll, maybe I won't name names right now. I understand, Lauren, that we're shy about getting sued. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, if you wanna talk to me privately, I can, tell, I can give you some names of people you should not be reading. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll let it go at that point. All right.